You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. Hey, it's Jordan. Before we take you to Quebec today for an in-depth look at the provincial election, I thought I'd tell you why we're not doing an episode focusing on the horrific stabbings in Saskatchewan. When we began this project four years ago, our goal was to take you outside of the news cycle to provide context and answers and thoughtful analysis, and to only bring you the news when there was a way to understand it. And we'll do that in the case of this story as soon as we can. But right now, pieces are still moving, people are sheltering in place, and any episode we recorded would be out of date and possibly totally irrelevant by the time you heard it. It turns out, podcasts, not great at breaking news. If you want up-to-the-minute news on this file, please visit our friends at City News, either on TV, on the radio, or at citynews.com. They have boots on the ground in the province right now, chasing updates. Meanwhile, until we tell that story, we'll focus on what we do best. One of my first politically engaged memories is watching the results roll in in the 1995 Quebec referendum on separation. Growing up, my family split our time between Ontario and Quebec, so the results were practical and personal to us. But even if they weren't, this still would have felt urgent. I remember that was when I saw real political anger for the first time. I thought about what it meant to live in a country where a whole bunch of people wanted out. As the decades passed, the rest of Canada mostly moved on from fears of Quebec separatism. Quebec, as you may imagine, did not, at least not completely. And so now, in a provincial election on October 3rd, Quebecers will have three different visions of sovereignty on the ballot. One, from the current government, that proposes sovereignty within Canada. One that is more of the traditional hardline version, that is still being pushed by a party that is no longer relevant. And one other, new, interesting vision of a sovereign Quebec. A vision in which Quebec is not even the only sovereign nation attached to this country. So what does that future of La Belle Provence look like? Who wants to take it there and do they have a shot? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Lisa Fitterman has worked for newspapers across Canada and the world as a reporter, editor, and columnist. She wrote this piece on one man's vision for a new Quebec in The Walrus. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Jordan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me on. Well, as this campaign begins, for those of us outside of Ontario and maybe even for the non-politically inclined Quebecers, I'd just first like to know, you know, what do we need to know about it? Is this a walk in the park for the current government? Yes, it is really a walk in the park for the Coalition Avenir Québécois. Uh, the question is, what? how big a majority really uh, is the party going to win? And who's fighting them for that majority? Who are the contenders in this election? I don't think it's a fight for the majority so much as it's a fight for second place. And the contenders are the Liberals, uh, the, the Provincial Liberal Party, Quebec Solidaire, uh, which is the left-wing party, uh, the Provincial Conservative Party, which was just founded, and, and the Parti Québécois. Let's talk about the Parti Québécois just for a second before we move on, because this was once an incredibly strong party in Quebec. You just listed them fifth. What happened? Okay. I, in effect, François Legault, the, the premier, took the wind out of the Parti Québécois sails because uh, he's offering sovereignty without separation to to uh, to voters which is something that that seems to make them more comfortable now in terms of the two contenders you know the liberals have been a force in quebec politics for forever um but you recently focused on the leader of quebec solidaire 
Maybe just tell us about him. First of all, introduce us. Well, Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois was a leader uh, in the uh, the student strikes that are known as the Maple Spring, Quebec's Maple Spring, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, He really impressed a lot of people then with his ability to think on his feet, uh, present arguments that were cogent, and stick to his principles. And now he is leading the the province's unapologetically left-wing party based on those same principles. Before we get to sovereignty, tell me about those left-wing principles and how progressive this party is. Quebec Solidaire was founded because members of the Parti Québécois were not happy with the direction the party had taken under Lucien Bouchard and, and Jacques Parizeau. They they believe in, in universal health care. They believe in affordable housing. They're environmentalists. They... they uh, want to ensure that senior citizens are able to remain in their homes for as long as possible while receiving the care that they they require uh, from the government. So it's there that those are the kind of principles the party is is running under. And you mentioned they're sort of neck and neck with the Liberals. How close is that race? And and did people in Quebec expect it to be this close by this election? You know, it's not clear. The polls are now saying that the Liberals have inched up a few points. But people I've known for a long time who never voted Quebec Solidaire in their lives, never thought that they would be voting left wing, have come up to me this week and said, I'm voting Quebec Solidaire because I don't want to vote for the Liberals and I don't know where else to go and I want a stronger opposition. I wonder, and again, this is coming from someone who doesn't spend a lot of time in Quebec, though though I have spent some, I wonder how much of this newfound support for a progressive party can be attributed to some of the divisive policies of the last few years in Quebec. And here I'm thinking uh, specifically, and maybe you can elaborate about uh, two of them, one about language and one in regards to religious garments. Okay, well, certainly with regard to religious garments and the law that was introduced by the uh, the the, uh, the the government has uh, proved ex- divisive for the province in terms of there are a lot of people in 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 Quebec who wear hijabs and turbans and and uh, and and kippahs and and they are not allowed to wear wear their religious symbols. At work, um, if they if they are considered to be working for the public service, which has been expanded to include the edu- public education system, the Quebec Solidaire is absolutely against this, and they voted against the bill in the in the uh, in the provincial uh, national assembly. Um, so is so so are the liberals, but the liberals have been very wishy-washy in terms of taking stances on another very divisive bill, uh, Bill 96, uh, which is an expansion of of, uh, the French language protections in the province. And a lot of people are very, very unhappy. How is the Coalition Avenir du Québec dealing with that backlash or... Is their support strong enough that they don't have to worry about it? Consider that the the, the government does not have a single seat in Montreal. Um, their their support is outside of the metropolitan areas, and mm. so they don't really care about how people here are feeling about it. That said, a decision in the Quebec Superior Court recently ruled that one of the provisions. Uh, which required mid-sized businesses to provide translation at their own expense for every kind of document or email, et cetera, that uh, it produced would have to be done at their own expense, and it was required. That the government said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll go back and think about it. So that's what they're doing right now. Now I want to talk about... Uh the elephant in the room, I guess, in this election, which is that Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois 
and Quebec Solidaire are, I guess, technically a sovereigntist party. Can you explain how that works? It's not a traditionally sovereigntist way of doing things. They, they believe that, that Quebec should be its own country. Uh, it's not something that is coming to the fore in this election. They don't. They don't go around saying, "We want Quebec to separate." That's that is that is not what they're what they're running on right now. And the kind of country that they envision is one that is made that is more in- inclusive. I, I think that was the reason I wanted to write the story about Gabriel Nadeau in the first place. There the vision of including First Nations peoples, of of including people who aren't white, Catholic, Francophones de souche, as they're called here, you know, people of the land, uh, in, in a country was, uh, is it, like a no-brainer for him. During our first interview, I asked him who he saw in, in, uh, in an independent Quebec, and he just looked at me as if I was crazy and said, well, everyone who lives in the province, they're, they're all Quebecois. What drew you to him as a profile subject? And how did that come through when you spoke uh, with him and spent time with him? I think that was his vision of, of an independent Quebec drew me to him. But the first thing that I noticed about him was how he really got on the premier's nerves. He was the one person in the National Assembly who could get a rise out of him, make him react. And I thought, that's really interesting. I, it was uh, over Bill 21. And I'm sure you remember the teacher in Chelsea, Quebec, who was in effect fired from her job because she wore a hijab. And he stood up and accused uh, Lego of being a Duplessis, you know, the, the premier who presided over the darkest period in Quebec's history. And uh, he said that Quebec needs people, you know, who are dedicated to their jobs and and passionate about their jobs, no matter if they wear a hijab or, or, as I said, a turban or or nothing, you know, nothing on their heads or on, you know, religious, religious symbols at all. So I just thought that's really interesting. I'm fascinated by this idea of uh, Quebec as an independent nation alongside other First Nations. But what I wonder is, you know, you mentioned they're not making it a huge issue in the campaign. Do we have any idea how many Quebecers are still even interested in separating from Canada? I feel like every time it's raised as a federal issue, we're kind of assured like, no, it's settled and it's done. Okay, uh, it'll never go away. It's it's an issue that's here for a long time. And in effect, about a third of Quebecers would vote to separate, a third would vote no, and a third want to go down the middle, down that that CAC middle, you know, where they they can have sovereignty without having to go through a referendum and uh, and, and separation. I'm really surprised by that because, as I say, I think uh, for people outside of Quebec— This is no longer an issue, at least certainly not to the degree it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago or, you know, longer ago than that when we were glued to the TV watching votes roll in. Yeah, but that's that is partially due to to how skillfully uh, Legault has has navigated this, I mean, potential minefield and has basically shown Quebecers that. You can have your cake and and eat it too. Although I wonder how long that that will go on for. Will that at some point become an issue between the two men, between Nadeau Dubois and Legault, uh, the different visions of sovereignty? You mentioned they're not really hard peddling it now, but it seems like the kind of thing Quebecers would be interested in during a campaign. You know, Quebecers really aren't interested in this during the campaign, which is why you see the Parti Québécois trailing way behind. Now the polls are showing that they could eke out one seat in the election, which is pretty pitiful. Well, let's talk about the electorate itself then. You know, if Legault is to lose voters and if uh, Quebec Solidaire 
is to jump over the liberals and form opposition. Who are we talking about? You know, what is Nadeau Dubois' target audience and how is he trying to pull them away uh, from CAQ or the liberals? I think that, first of all, his base is is mostly young people um, in working class areas of, of metropolitan areas like Montreal and Quebec. Um, he will draw from senior citizens uh, who are unhappy with the choices they have uh, with with uh, the, the CAC and the Liberals. And he will draw perhaps in areas like I, I went to see him outside of, of the outside of the Montreal area in Ramouski. And there it's been a, a Parti Québécois stronghold for 25 years, and the CAC could be very well poised to take that that riding. Legault's weakness, uh, if there is a weakness, is in his handling of the seniors' care homes uh, during the pandemic and the thousands upon thousands of deaths that occurred there. And in the metropolitan areas, where Quebec Solidaire has not penetrated, like I live in, in the kind of south central area of the city, and there's a great chance here for the for Quebec Solidaire to make inroads. I realize I haven't asked you much, if anything, about the Liberals in all this. Why is that? Is there anything that stands out uh, about the Liberals in this election? I think the Liberals are trying to find a footing and a raison d'être after... For, being for so long the the standard bearers for federalism in the province uh, and 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 under its current leader they they've just taken many missteps that have left people with a bad taste voters who have voted for them in the past without even thinking with a bad taste in their mouths um, there has been a anglo rights party that has come out of this and a Montreal rights party that has also come out of out of uh, the Liberals handling of, of Bill 96 and there are some wonderful uh, politicians coming up within the ranks of the of the Liberal Party but they're still young and and uh, so people really are looking for a stronger opposition. The campaign only began last week. As we move into the next couple of weeks of it, what will you be looking for to get a sense of if the landscape will change? At this point, I'm still looking at at people, you know, what people are saying on the street. Um, I'll be reading the papers in outside of Montreal, outside of Quebec City. I'll be following the campaign in Romuski and in the Gaspé, in, in uh, the eastern townships. I want to see what the arguments are out there and how people are responding to the promises of Legault and, and the Liberals and, and Quebec Solidaire. Uh, it's, it's, uh, at this point, it's... The, the margins are still very much up in the air. Those regions you just mentioned, are those the typical regions that decide a Quebec provincial election, or is that different? It is the regions that decide the election. It's, it's, it's weighted that way. It's kind of like the U.S. It's, you, know, you, have, you have much more sparsely populated areas that hold a great amount of power. Lisa, thank you so much for this, and I guess we'll uh, we'll all watch those areas for the next little while. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for having me on. Lisa Fitterman writing in The Walrus. That was The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. As I mentioned off the top, if you need breaking news out of Saskatchewan because the situation is still developing, please go to citynews.com. You can find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. You can talk to us anytime via email, hello at TheBigStoryPodcast.ca. And of course, you can find this podcast wherever you get them or on your smart speaker by saying, play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.